We're here for a conversation with one of the great public servants of our time and also one of the people who best combines um, an, a perceptive analysis about the ills of government with a diagnosis about its potential. And it was so interesting last night to hear Peter Orzag talk about and to try to analyze it soberly and contrast that with his belief that intelligent cost-benefit analysis and rational public policy actually can overcome that polarization and make government work. So I'm right now the head of a wonderful institution, the National Constitution Center. And it's a place in Philadelphia that has a mandate from Congress to disseminate information about the U.S. Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. So I, my mission, our mission, is to promote constitutional conversations around the country that bring all sides together in these polarized times and allow people to converge around their common focus on the Constitution. That's why I'm so eager to get Peter's further thoughts on the causes of polarization. I want to dig deeply, because he's really thought about this, try to figure out what the causes are, what the solutions are, and then to talk about his extraordinary experience in government, first at the Congressional Budget Office, more recently at OMB, and how he reconciles what he's seen about polarization with his faith in the possibilities of government. So, welcome, Peter. Thank you. Glad to be here. And let me actually first point out that it's uh, Valentine's Day and my lovely wife is here, so uh, thank you for being here. Very good move. That's an <laughs> excellent way to begin. Last night you said, people are wrong to think that polarization in D.C. is caused by partisan gerrymandering. In fact, that's a small part of the problem. The real problem is sorting, the fact that people of like minds are living in the same areas. Tell us why partisan gerrymandering is not a factor and why sorting is more important. So if you look at uh, the patterns of residential segregation, um, basically Republicans are increasingly living in Republican neighborhoods and Democrats are increasingly uh, living in Democratic neighborhoods. And any way that you could draw the spaghetti around those neighborhoods to gerrymander them, they would still produce highly polarized congressional districts. So the gerrymandering makes the situation worse, but the underlying cause, if you will, is that at the neighborhood level, we are sorting ourselves into Republican and Democratic neighborhoods. Um, one way of looking at that is uh, at the county level. So there are about 3,000 counties in the US, in the United States, and the probability that you live in a county that landslides in your direction, so votes in a presidential election by a overwhelming majority in your, you know, in your favor, has more than doubled since the 1970s. And today, the majority of Americans live in those kinds of landslide counties. So again, any way that you might want to draw congressional districts around those counties, you're going to wind up with highly polarized congressional districts. Why is it though, I understand that the districts are all Republican or all Democratic, but they're also more extreme than they were a generation ago. Some have said that low voter turnout has something to do with this and allows the interest groups on both sides to have great influence in the primaries. Tell us more about that. Well, I do think this is a huge problem. I mean, only about half of Americans vote. Um, in other countries, the, it has been shown, like Australia, for example, uh, that Mandatory voting uh, increases voter turnout, shockingly. Basically, we make it, a, <laughs> make it a crime not to vote, people vote. Um, and what the lack of turnout does is it does exacerbate this uh, underlying phenomenon in the sense that only the people who are most motivated will turn out to vote. In fact, I I'm an economist. Economists have long puzzled as to why anyone votes, because if you do the rational cost benefit analysis, the probability that you're Individual vote will alter an election is zero, and yet there's some costs associated with going down to the voting station and what have you. So if we were all perfectly rational, no one would vote. Uh, the flip side of that is the people who are most motivated to vote have, you know, have a strong conviction around something. And so the lack of universal turnout on both sides does add to this polarization or exacerbates it. So the extremes dominate who wins the primary, and then in these safe, mostly R or D districts, the person who wins the primary wins the general, and that results in more extreme candidates. Um, so moderates have disappeared from the Congress. And in fact, th this is striking, because people often 
say, if we only had an, you know, a Lyndon Johnson type of congressional <coughs> negotiator who could weave his or her way through Congress, we would get a lot more done. But the fact of the matter is, when Lyndon Johnson was president, there was, a, there was much more overlap between the parties. The intersection between, there were liberal Republicans and there were conservative Democrats, and basically, um, with the possible exception of like one or two people from Maine, they, they don't exist anymore. What would the framers have thought about this? I have to ask as the head of the National Constitution Center, and I just heard a wonderful speech from Larry Kramer, the head of the Hewlett Foundation, uh, just a few days ago. And he said James Madison would have been appalled by this situation, because for Madison, compromise was the essence of the constitutional system, and the need for both parties to come together and strike deals was what he designed the Constitution to do. Madison originally opposed political parties, which he thought would lead to factions, but he changed his mind about that and came to think that they could be forces for compromise because both parties would have to trade off. To what degree does the decline of the parties contribute to this polarization, and what would Madison have thought about that? So the basic fact pattern over the past several decades in U.S. politics has been the alignment of ideology with party. So while parties are less dominant um, today than they were uh, in the 1950s or 60s for the typical congressman because they can raise funds in alternative ways, for example. Uh, at the same time, ideology has become much more aligned with party. So, as I said before, there were conservative Democrats before and there were liberal Republicans. Basically, that doesn't exist today. Um, the decline of parties by themselves, basically, if you think about it this way, parties in general do want to win general elections and they want to win national elections. And so from that perspective, the parties are centralizing forces because at the national level, as opposed to in a polarized district, you need to appeal to the increasingly vanishing swing voter. And that is a hugely centralizing force, which is why the typical pattern in US politics is that during a primary election, the politicians will run to the right or left and then during the general election, they'll come back to the center. And to the extent that parties can represent that second stage and enforce it, it does help. We're not really in that situation today. So the lack of, uh, or the alignment of ideology and party combined with the decline of party leadership, if, in a sense, that it's harder to control the rank and file. You see that in the House of Representatives today. John Boehner's central dilemma is the, is the tension between uh, what a lot of the rank and file wants and what he knows is what the swing voter would want and you can see that play out in his Daily existence. It's playing out in real time today with regard to the Department of Homeland Security and its funding That is exactly the tension the Senate Republicans who are um, Thinking more about retaining the Senate in 2016 and somewhat more centrist are focused on what the swing voter might want and the rank and file in the house is focused on what the people back in their congressional districts want, and both of those are totally rational perspectives for each of those parties to adopt. And does this polarization of the parties clash with uh, the views of the people as a whole, who, according to some studies at Pew, are less polarized and actually converge more on issues than not? So the, you started with gerrymandering, and what I find fascinating is every if you tune into CNN, the number one uh, claim about polarization would be it's caused by gerrymandering. The serious political scientists who study this all agree that that's a factor, but it's like 10%, not 60%. Um, and yet there's a raging debate that is occurring the, between what I would call the uh, Stanford School and the um, North Carolina School of Thought on this with regard to whether, if it's not gerrymandering, is it just that the elites are polarizing relative to a centrist population? Or is it that the population itself is polarizing and that's then reflected in our national politics? And that matters a lot because if it's just the elites, then there's some hope that you, by kind of changing the elites, you can solve the problem. If we are polarizing ourselves, it's a deeper problem because it's what we're doing. And I think the evidence suggests that at least a significant part of this is that we, the people, have become more polarized ourselves. We're less polarized than the Congress, right? that's clear, but relative to the way we were 20 or 30 years ago, we are more polarized. And I think that comes back to some of the things that we were 
briefly mentioning last night, which is if you if you basically only talk to people who think like you do, um, first of all, you want to prove that you're a true member of the tribe. So you kind of you know uh, underscore your own views perhaps a little bit more strongly, and you only get self-reinforcing views. And the world as presented by Fox and the world as presented by MSNBC on the same for the same event are just dramatically different things. So if you if your neighbors think like you do and your online experience, your virtual experience is also reinforcing, your views become more extreme. And, and the evidence in favor of that proposition, so that it's not just the leads. Mm -hmm. First of all, if you if it were just the elites, you'd expect people to say that the share of Americans to say my member of Congress is too extreme for me to have gone up. It hasn't. You'd also expect that state legislatures, which are closer to the people, to have polarized less than the federal House of Representatives. And the evidence suggests that in two thirds of the state, state legislatures have polarized more than the federal House of Representatives. So uh, I think there's a, a, there is a raging debate about this and there are kind of legitimate views on both sides, but there's at least a significant amount of evidence suggesting that the trend has been towards a more polarized electorate. And that's really the deepest problem because if it were gerrymandering, it's almost like I wish the problem were gerrymandering because it would be hard to fix. We'd have to pass redistricting laws, but at least you'd know what to do. And then the second layer would be, if it's not that, I wish it were just the elites in Washington because if the, the schmucks in Washington are the problem, vote in new schmucks and fix the problem that way. But if it's at least partly us, that's a much harder problem to fix. You said last night that one fix for it was to expose people to views of the opposite side. And that's why one of the most thrilling uh, initiatives in America is the National Constitution Center's We the People Constitutional <laughs> Podcast. You heard it here. <laughs> Absolutely. No, this is really exciting, guys. Every week I call up the top liberal and conservative scholar in the country to, to discuss the constitutional issue of the week. These things are completely finding a national audience, 300,000 downloads a week, ranked number two among 700,000 podcasts. Uh, There's hope. In the country, there is hope. And the thing is, when you do bring, bring, bring people together, they don't always agree, but they can debate civilly and they can find areas of agreement. It's a really inspiring Welcome thing. to the Aspen Institute. Absolutely. <laughs> what are other, <laughs> thank you. In addition to the glories of Aspen and the NCC, what are some other solutions to this problem of the people's polarization? Look, we, even if uh, that is one of the core problems, we can still, at the margin, try to uh, take the edge off of many of the other issues. So gerrymandering may be only 10% of the rise in uh, polarization in the U.S. House of Representatives, but it's still 10%, and so congressional redistricting can help. The Senate rules that uh, exacerbate <laughs> polarization could, could also, in theory, be changed. Um, when you get down to the nub of... Uh, the electorate's polarization, however, I just, other than exposing yourself, it, just, it almost sounds airy-fairy, expose yourself to other views and hope that we all come together. It's not like we're going to force people to move out of Republican neighborhoods and into Democratic neighborhoods and, and vice versa. And it's not like you can force people to, um, you know, if you vote Democratic, your cable television will only show Fox News and vice versa. Uh, <laughs> If only, right? So uh, it's a. I, I think it's a. It given the force that is so powerful in the opposite direction towards um, self-reinforcing views, it requires a lot of effort to overcome. But it's not like you can snap your fingers and say this one thing or this one policy is going to undo it. I, I I wish I had the panacea, but I don't. Okay, you very well analyzed the problem. You've given us some possible solutions. Now I want to turn to your incredible experience in government uh, and your belief that, in fact, uh, reason, rationality, cost-benefit analysis can create good policy. Is there a tension between the problem you've just described, where Washington is not susceptible to these sort of reasoned uh, results, and the kind of policy that you were trying to champion, let's start with, at the Congressional Budget Office, to give a specific example. When you began by analyzing healthcare. Tell us about the agreement or disagreement around solutions and how those policy agreements clashed or didn't clash with the reality of the politics. Well, first let me say a word about the Congressional Budget Office, which is about to celebrate its 40th anniversary, uh, actually this month. So it is a remarkable institution that um, 
you wouldn't actually think would have worked because it has no institutional protections really. It doesn't have, um, its director can be dismissed by a simple majority vote in either the House or the Senate. Its budget's set each year by the Congress. So you'd think that it would not be a force that was independent and rigorous and what have you. And yet it has developed into that um, despite the lack of institutional protections. And I think a lot, I give a lot of credit for that to the first director, Alice Rivlin, who set the tone in the internal culture and the external culture. And so um, those of us who were privileged enough to lead the organization thereafter inherited this, uh, this great legacy and it was just our job not to mess it up. Um, CBO is also uh, interesting in the sense that my interactions with both Republican and Democrat, Democrats, House uh, and Senate were actually remarkably fact-based. There were a couple occasions where people would uh, challenge the facts and we could talk about some of those, but in general on both sides, um, the view was CBO is here to deliver the facts, period. And so let's talk about the facts. So much so actually that at my confirmation hearing to the Obama administration at the Office of Management and Budget, one of the Republican senators stood up, or didn't stand up, grabbed the microphone and said, well, it seems like based on your CBO experience, both even the people on our side seem to like you. Now, how long do you think that's going to last in your new job? <laughs> and that was kind of right. Um, but CBO, CBO, actually another, another quick story on polarization. I became friends with Paul Ryan, um, at, which may surprise people, um, based on my role at the Congressional Budget Office, so much so that even when I was in office and we disagree about lots of things, um, we stayed in touch. And uh, sometime during the heat of the healthcare uh, debate, which he obviously was very opposed to the Affordable Care Act and I was very much in favor of it, he called me up and told me that he had just won the Congressional Hunting Award. And uh, I obviously was not raised correctly because instead of complimenting him, I said, well, have you seen your competition? And he took offense at that and asked me whether I had uh, ever shot a gun. And the fact of the matter is, about 30 years ago, up at summer camp in Maine, there were a bunch of Jewish kids pretending to be Rambo. <laughs> and I was an NRA expert marksman, which I relayed to him. And he then said, well, that must have been a 22." And I immediately realized what a mistake I had made because I didn't even remember what kind of gun I had shot when I was 12. So I uh, wound up at the congressional uh, shooting range with Representative Ryan. Wow. And then I made the mistake of going from there to the White House. Wait, hold uh, on. How'd you do at the shooting range? Actually, better than he wanted me to do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> In honesty, but it was all good. Um, and I, uh, the OMB directors granted what's called Iron Gate privileges, which means the Secret Service is not supposed to stop you. Um, but I had gone directly from the shooting range to the White House. <laughs> So I can just tell you that the White House gun detection and powder detection system, whatever that is, works really well. And this poor Secret Service guard had tension between algorithm one, which is don't stop someone on the Iron Gate privilege list, and algorithm two, which is whenever the gunpowder detection system goes off, stop that person immediately. And what did he do? I actually saw the panic on his face and said, I'm sorry, I just came from a gun range and it was okay. He told me to change. <laughs> Excellent. So why did CBO work? Again, I think it's inertia matters a lot. And the initial legacy was very important. By the way, there's always a threat. Um, the Congressional Budget Office is actually about to receive a new, or will, there will be a new director named. And at any time, the thing that's interesting about having established an independent reputation and a rigorous reputation is you can, it takes a lot of work to build it up, but you can blow that very fast. And each time a director is named, there's always this concern about whether it will become a, a more partisan, less professional place. It hasn't happened so far, but that doesn't mean it never will. So at CBO, you famously champion cost containment in healthcare, and your conclusions were embraced by both sides, Republicans and Democrats. And of course, there more than <laughs> well, <laughs> embrace might be a little strong. <laughs> tolerated by Republicans, tolerated. And embraced okay. by Democrats. Uh, and of course, uh, the core of Obamacare was famously proposed by Mitt Romney. So what was it about the debate over Obamacare that made it so polarizing uh, since before the bill got proposed, there seemed to be more agreement on policy than disagreement? Well, I think this is an example of where the political polarization plays into uh, 
policy. Um, you know, an example is the debate over death panels, which were never in the legislation, and uh, and yet it became this. I remember I was with uh, my older kids in Maine driving down Route 302 in the middle of the summer, and there were all these signs up saying "Stop the death panels," and they they were asking what what is why are you doing that? And the fact that there wasn't any doesn't didn't matter for those signs. There was a dramatic disconnect, and there still is, frankly. If you ask most people, are you or if you ask most people of a political, particular political persuasion, are you in favor of Obamacare? They'll say no. Are you in favor of privately provided health insurance through uh, an exchange that allows competition in order to bid down prices? The answer is yes. Um, and th that's an illustration of just, we have gone into a world in which it's okay to just speak in generalities without the details behind it, and people often are um, surprised by the details. The epitome of this was the the um, one woman who was quoted as saying, "Keep the government away from my Medicare." <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty great. Yeah. <laughs> so, as a uh, Supreme Court uh, wonk, I can't help but ask, what happens if the court strikes down the federally created? Exchanges. Is that the end of Obamacare, or would a bunch of states repass the exchanges on their own? I think it would be, I think it's the most serious threat to the Affordable Care Act at this point. The big concern at the beginning, don't forget, was that the exchanges would not have enough people in them that you would avoid the traditional problem with health insurance, which is an adverse selection spiral. So um, only the sickest people sign up. Uh, therefore, the premiums are very high. Therefore, no one uh, would want the insurance unless they're even sicker than the people who are on uh, the exchanges, and then it just spirals and collapses. Uh, and that was a, you know, there were a lot of predictions that that would, was what would occur. It has not occurred. And so if we were, were on actually a decent trajectory in terms of avoiding that, I, the biggest risk, um, that the whole thing just kind of wouldn't work. Uh, the... Supreme Court decision, if it were to rule that only, so just for those who are not following this carefully, the case before in the court is basically whether the subsidies that were provided that make that insurance on the exchanges affordable for most of the people who are purchasing it, um, whether that, uh, whether they can only be received if the exchange was, quote, established by the state, end quote, or whether uh, all the exchanges, including the ones that, the states that opted to have the federal government set up the exchange for them, whether that works also. So what happens if they basically rule that it's only literally it has to be established by the state? Now, you have to then look at, there are about two dozen states that have uh, uh, not, uh, that have adopted the federal exchange, and some of them have done it out of uh, convenience. They would likely do a workaround, like you suggest. However, the workaround will take time. In many of those states, you need to go back to the legislature um, and there's a time lapse there. There's there's confusion about exactly you know, what happens in the meanwhile. Um, there's also this interesting question about even if the court rules that way, exactly what is established by the state mean? Can you put a kind of hi we're we're the state of X um, portal with the back end provided entirely by the federal government? Is that established by the state? Sort of what is the def how much effort is required in order for it to be quote established by the state? But the bigger problem is there are. I would say two thirds to three quarters of the states that have adopted the federal exchange that have done it out of antipathy. They didn't, the, the state legislature or the governor did not want to embrace Obamacare. And so the federal exchange came into being basically out of necessity. And in those states, it's kind of hard to see exactly what the path is to getting to um, a, an exchange that's established by the states, the state. And the best evidence suggests that something like 8 million people would lose health insurance uh, if net of all that, what I just said, uh, if the Supreme Court ruled uh, against the administration, and that for the remainder who retained their insurance, this, the premiums would go up significantly because the sick, because basically only the sickest people would still voluntarily purchase insurance. And so even if you're a healthy person wanting to buy into uh, one of those exchanges, you've got the problem that the insurance companies naturally have to price to the people who are actually buying the insurance and they tend to be sicker and so the premiums go up.
So it was, among the various threats to Obamacare, many people had talked about uh, the Republican takeover of the Senate. That's a much less salient. There will be some things like there's a tax on medical devices that's probably going to get repealed. But in, in terms of the dominant threat, it's actually the Supreme Court at this point. And that illustrates another issue involving the polarization, which is given how polarized the political system is, you need three of three. You need the White House, the House, and the Senate to do anything big. If you've got one of three or two of three, it doesn't really matter. And moving from two to one or one to two makes some difference at the margin, but it's only when you go from one or two to three of three that something really big can happen. And that's exactly the point with regard to the Affordable Care Act, which is the administration's going to veto, the president will veto any major threat to the legislation. So unless you have veto-proof majorities in both houses, there's a lot of rhetoric, but it's not as salient a concern as many people have thought. The place where you get three of three is in the states, where often all three branches are under the same party control. They get stuff done. Is that a good thing? So whether uh, this polarization and inertia is a good thing or not really depends on uh, whether you think the status quo works for you or not. Yeah, the bottom line is if something needs to change, it's a bad thing that nothing can change. And if nothing needs to change, then it might be a good thing that you're not kind of meandering left and right um, back and forth. Uh, I'd say on net, at this point, at least at the federal level, it's a problem because there are a lot of issues from reinforcing what's happened in healthcare where the trends on costs have been dramatic, and I want to come back to that in a second, to climate change. There, there are a whole series of things to addressing the woes of the middle class. There are a whole series of things that would be beneficial if we could act, but we're stymied because of this split. So the answer depends on kind of where you are and whether the current situation is sustainable or not. You wanted to come back to the cost of So just for a second, just a little bit of, I don't want to call it advertising, but since you did all that. <laughs> of course. Um, That's what Socrates is for. There we go. Uh, last year in 2014, uh, Medicare spending per beneficiary in inflation-adjusted terms was lower than in 2013. If I had stood up at the Aspen Ideas Festival in 2010 and said, I think in 2014, Medicare spending is going to fall on a per-person basis. I would have been laughed out of, even despite how uh, polite most people are at Aspen, I, I would have been widely mocked. Um, Medicare spending last year was $126 billion lower than what the Congressional Budget Office projected for 2014 as recently as 2010. These are just phenomenal changes. So much so that it remains the case that if the trend that we've been experiencing in Medicare were to continue, and I believe that it could if we reinforced it, everything that's commonly said about the fiscal trajectory facing the United States in terms of how disastrous it is would be wrong. The, entire, the bulk of our long-term fiscal problem has to do with healthcare costs. The reason those official projections look so scary is mostly because the official projections take the last 20 or 25 years of spending per beneficiary growth and project that forward. And if you took the last five years instead, the picture looks dramatically different. So we should be talking much more about how to reinforce what's happening, where you're seeing the share of patients who are readmitted to a hospital within a month declining, hospital-acquired infections way down, the cost trends quite positive, how we can reinforce all of that rather than uh, kind of continuing to uh, just rely on outdated, potentially outdated projections um, with no kind of follow through on what to do. Is the public not able to absorb good news that comes in technical forms? Actually, I think this news is starting slowly to, to get out, although uh, not, not fully. Um, I think we, that comes back to the polarization point, which is the fact of the matter is facts never convince people or they rarely convince people. If you, if you believe the sky is blue and someone comes around and somehow shows you a green sky, you're not going to believe it and vice versa. So it, it uh, back to your earlier question, which I didn't really answer because I meandered about some shooting range story. Um, polarization does make evidence-based policymaking harder because people are colored to believe one thing or another depending on their ideology. And that makes it very hard to just kind of follow the facts because people don't agree on what the facts are. Um, and yet, despite 
the fact that polarization makes evidence-based policy making more difficult. You've just contributed to this riveting book, the national bestseller, Moneyball for Government, which they, argues... They didn't really say national bestseller. They did, and they're not allowed to say that if it's not, so it okay. must be. Because that's Especially in an evidence-based book. Right? Yes, exactly. We really hope it is. Um, I was. I had one national bestseller as well. It's not. You don't have to sell all that many copies to be a national bestseller. <laughs> <laughs> the argument of this riveting collection of essays is that evidence-based policy. To both of you who bought the book, thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, matters. And you have an uh, essay which is both interesting and impressive because of your co-author, uh, who is Jim. Uh, Nussel. Nussel. Um, and he was OMB director under President uh, George uh, uh, w. w. Bush. I, I, can't, I really can't read at this stage without, uh, without glasses. Um, this chapter gives examples of policies that have worked, including Head Start. Uh, tell us how Head Start is evidence-based and why it managed to be endorsed by two administrations. And is that an exception to the rule or does it prove the rule? There are actually a bunch of programs. Um, the, the, the even more inspiring example is the Nurse Family Partnership, which has to do with um, home visitation programs. Very solid, um, randomized control trial even uh, evidence that it works. Head Start, similar, the evidence... Actually, Head Start is a great example of the ambiguities that often arise. So the initial evidence on Head Start and other uh, early education, preschool education programs was very positive, that it improved outcomes uh, for young children. Then the next layer of evidence was quite negative, the so-called fade-out effect, where um, by um, middle and high school, the beneficial effects seemed like it, they had faded out, even for very intense programs, more intense interventions than Head Start. And then the latest uh, research suggests that even though grades may not be better in, uh, you know, uh, test scores may not be higher in grade 10 for the kids who got early education or high quality early education relative to others. Lots of other life indicators from employment to uh, staying out of jail to what have you are better off for those children than for others, even coming out of randomized control trials where you can be somewhat more confident that there's a causal effect. So it's an example of where you have to also be careful with evidence-based policy making because if we had concluded from that intermediate, that uh, middle level of evidence, that fade out was dominant and therefore just kind of ditched the programs, we would not have received the evidence that uh, actually there are a whole variety of things that work uh, that, you know, that where the benefits are manifest themselves. And there's also the point, and one thing that both the Bush administration and the Obama administration pushed for, is not all Head Start programs and not all early education programs are the same. And so even within a program where the evidence suggests that there are some benefits, um, you have high performers and low performers. And one of the things that uh, we push for and that is now happening is to try to call out the lower performer Head Start programs and redirect resources towards the better performers so that we get improvement in average quality, even within a program that has lots of benefits. And how come you and the Bush administration were able to engage in that degree of evidence-based policy making, given the polarization? Well, we tried like 10,000 things, and these were the two that worked. So <laughs> it, we, we, we talk in the book about the ones that work rather than uh, you know, all the frustrations with the ones that did it. But yes, if you, if you try lots and lots of things, occasionally something will work. Um, uh, the recovery. And OMB, you were at the center of the most dramatic financial crisis of the late uh, 20th century. Or, uh, and by many accounts, uh, not the Tea Party, but, but many other mainstream Republican and Democratic accounts, uh, the recovery was a success. Give us an inside view of the, the goals that you set out using evidence-based policy making, how you basically successfully pursued them, and, and what the political pressures were on the well, first of all, I'd give us like a B plus or A minus, not an A plus, because the recovery could be could have been even stronger if we could have done better, but it was not an F. Um, so that's the first point. The second point is um, part of the reason for that was that we at the time in late 2008 did not realize how bad, the, we knew the situation was bad, but the data since then have, has shown it was much worse than we knew. And that reinforces another point, which is 
a lot of the infrastructure, the government statistical infrastructure, is outdated. Um, you could know, I, I, I track healthcare spending, for example, uh, on a real-time basis in a way that relies, I'd say, only about 50% on government statistics, and there are a whole bunch of other things that feed into that. And uh, we could have possibly, if, if there had been more investment previously in how to combine private sector data, which is now more universal and easily accessible, with the official statistics, which are survey-based and labbed, um, we could have possibly known at the time just how much more serious uh, the situation actually was. So that was one thing that led to it being turning out to be a B plus instead of an A plus. And the second thing was uh, miscalibrating or misunderstanding the nature of the recovery so that following a financial crisis, you often wind up with these kind of L-shaped recoveries where uh, it's a hard, kind of hard slog for an extended period of time instead of a V-shaped recovery like what happened after the IT bust. Every macroeconometric model from the Federal Reserve's to the Congressional Budget Office to our own one was saying, this is bad. They didn't, again, we didn't know quite how bad it was. This is bad, but we will bounce back fast. And the reason they were doing that was that they were effectively mimicking what happened in 2000 and 2001, where there was a, a loss of wealth from the IT bus that was a, about equivalent to the initial loss of wealth from the housing bust, and then the economy bounced back. And the reason that that didn't happen in 2008, 2009, was that the losses, instead of being widely distributed across equity markets, were heavily concentrated in highly leveraged financial institutions. And macroeconometric models don't have that level of detail. So they were just wrong. And that's a problem that's still that's being addressed, but it's not fully being addressed. All that having been said, um, within the political constraints, I think we did as well as we possibly could have in 2008, 2009. The issue really became coming into 2010 and 11 that there was too quick a pivot to um, cutting back rather than providing more support to the economy. And I believe uh, that the deal that was struck in 2011 to make all the middle class tax cuts permanent and to then restrain discretionary spending is going to wind up, when we look back at it in five, six, seven years, to look like it was a big mistake. So non-defense discretionary spending, for example, which is everything from Homeland Security to the FBI to, um, to the FDA to the National Institutes of Health and so on and so forth, uh, is slated to fall. It's actually already at a level that's basically as low as a share of GDP as it's ever been on record since the data began in 1962. And we're scheduled to uh, reduce it further by about a half a percent of GDP. I don't think that's likely to happen. And that's a manifestation of one of the ways in which policymaking probably was not ideal. Great. I want to open it up in a second, but I, let me end with one historical question that I can't resist asking. Was there a previous period when this kind of evidence-based policymaking was more successful? I think of my hero, uh, Louis Brandeis. And whenever I have a hard question, I ask WWBD, what would Brandeis do? <laughs> and this was the avatar of facts. He yeah. wrote the famous Brandeis brief, which just besieged the Supreme Court with all this evidence that women were being harmed by oppressive work conditions and needed maximum hour laws. And he designed the Federal Trade Commission and the... Uh, was a great champion of uh, progressive era reforms, the, the bank uh, reforms as well. But Brandeis never imposed all of his reforms from above. It wasn't the rule of experts. He believed you had to win over the hearts and minds of the people. So it took a political movement, the progressive movement, to mobilize between 1890 and the election of 1913, by which point all three parties were in favor of trust bust busting and shared Brandeis's opposition to the curse of bigness. So the question is, is evidence-based policy making enough, or do you really have to win the hearts and minds of the people? And is that possible in a polarized age? We definitely have to win the hearts and minds of the people because uh, saying, again, A is true when it's not believed by half of the population doesn't really get you very far. But what's interesting about the historical examples is, um, in a sense, we have it's much easier to produce analysis today. We have much better, easier access to data. The analytics are 
you know, I can run a million regressions a second uh, on Amazon's cloud uh, in a way that 40 years ago had to be done by hand and would take months and months and years and years and years. So you can do the analytics uh, much easier, much faster. The availability of data is much more widespread. But at the same time, that advance of technology has been one of the contributing factors to the polarization that then means that a lot of those facts aren't useful. So net net, I don't know where that where that comes out. I also am not entirely sure how you build at this point. I mean, this is in some sense what the Moneyball for Government folks are trying to do, build a political movement in favor of fact-based um, policy making. It's a it's a hard thing to do. There has to be more or less. Despite best selling <laughs> the thrilling, riveting books like that. The, the, the progressive movement was against the trust. There was a villain, and the thought is that they were, by concentrated power, oppressing citizens and leading to unfairness. So there is movement both on the Tea Party right and the Occupy Wall Street left for economic populism, but it sounds like that's not the core of your... No, I think, look, what happens when people are frustrated is they, uh, and that was true after the recession of 1893, it was true after the great uh, financial crisis uh, recently, uh, is that people uh, get frustrated with the existing order and existing institutions. So extremism becomes much more dominant when people are frustrated and not happy with uh, their situation. And I guess to, to answer your question, yes, in that situation it becomes harder to drive things in a fact-based way, but I, e even without that, I think um, the polarization trend has been in the U.S. You know, a growing thing over the past three decades, not a step change that just occurred in 2008 or 9. Great. I would love to continue, but it's time for your questions for Peter Gorzak. Please pose them. Yes. Uh, I'm actually a practicing physician. And uh, my question for you is uh, when uh, I know we fund hostility to quality uh, discussions, we're focused on customer satisfaction Use my and also on uh, patient outcomes. Those mm -hmm. are the two things we focus on. We basically never discuss about. I know in Obamacare, value is almost expressly delayed. Do you think that's ever going to really enter the conversation about what net gain, net gain is or what it might be? So I guess I have a little bit of a different perspective. I think uh, the one of the key things, in addition to developing a lot of the metrics on how you measure patient satisfaction and, and how you're measuring outcomes, uh, is that we have to pay for them. Because if you pay for... Under a fee-for-service system where you're paying for quantity, guess what? You wind up with quantity. And it's only, you only get to value in other markets, including in healthcare, if that's what you pay for. So as you know, there is a movement both among private payers and actually in Medicare also to move in that direction. Now, we haven't moved as definitively as I would like. I was actually very encouraged. The secretary of HHS uh, about two or three weeks ago came out and said, by the end of 2016, 30% of Medicare payments will be um, value-based in some way, and we have to come back to what that means as a bundle payment account for care revenues, but at least directionally that's helpful, and 50% by the end of 2018. At the same time, every major private insurance company, Aetna, Cigna, uh, United, what have you, they are all also pushing in the same direction. So there is, uh, I think, issues involved in all the different models that are, that are called value-based, and sometimes the value component is very small. Um, something could be value-based payment even if the value-based payment is a small share of the total. But I'm actually encouraged, at least directionally, that we're moving that way. And I, I believe one of the drivers of the low-cost trend in Medicare is the expectation among most hospital administrators that that's where we're going. If you go out and ask hospital executives what share of payments will be value-based, 2016, 2017, you get these amazingly high, in fact, higher than I think will actually be the case, uh, responses. And it's a little bit of the aircraft carrier theory that if you think the system's moving that way, you're going to start turning the ship now. Although when I said that to one of my friends who's a hospital executive a couple months ago, he said, yes, but the problem is the worst place to be is to have one foot on the dock and one foot on the boat. And right now that's where I am. So I, you, know, you have to be more definitive about is the boat actually moving away from the dock or not. Yeah, so I'm hopeful. The other piece of this is 
this is a little bit further down the road to be, so the question was, are we gonna get beyond more just compliance-based metrics? So you really wanna get to outcomes. Are you making the patient healthier? Um, it is very hard to do that if you don't have a digitized system of electronic health records. So one of the more encouraging trends is even though the electronic systems are having difficulty talking to one another, and that's the next stage, at least the system is much more digital today. The share of hospitals that use electronic health records, the share of um, physician offices that use electronic health records, much higher, like 60% relative to 10% in 2008. And that then opens up the possibility of out, outcome-based measures that are real. So you're measuring someone's state of health based on actual, you know, their blood pressure, their this, their that, rather than just, did you take their blood pressure? Great, that's correct. Uh, I'll follow on to that. The best way to reduce healthcare costs would actually be to keep people healthy rather than fix them later. Using measures like healthy school lunches, uh, all kinds of social engineering slash social determinants of health, keep people out of jail instead of paying jail costs. When are we going to start thinking about that? So again, I think we are, uh, you know, the progress, we're starting from a low base. Um, I'm on the board of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which has now switched itself from um, basically being about healthcare to being about promoting a culture of health, which is exactly uh, in line with what you're saying. Um, the evidence suggests that we may have seen uh, a, it's still at a, a level that's much too high, but we may have seen at least a flattening of the childhood obesity trend, which would be encouraging. Um, Schools have made progress in terms of uh, the lunches that they serve. It's still not where it should be, but at least there's attention being paid, paid to that. Um, so I'm very much aligned in terms of what needs to happen. But you're no longer in government. No, but I'm saying it's happening. I mean, so it, it's, not, it's, not, it's not as rapidly as I'd like, but it's nonetheless, uh, there is some progress from a low base. The other thing I want to say about health and I think this requires a lot more attention. I'm co-chairing a panel at the National Academies on the gradient in health and life expectancy by socioeconomic status, which is just startling. So basically, there's a lot of discussion about how life expectancy is increasing, which it has been. There's very little discussion about how the, that is driven almost entirely by what's happening in the top 40 to 50% of the population. And at the bottom of the socioeconomic distribution, life expectancy is flat to down. So the gap in life expectancy between a higher earner and a lower earner is literally exploding. And, and by exploding, I mean uh, relative to you know two or three decades ago, that gap has increased by four or five years, which in demographic terms is mind-blowingly fast. So we need to be doing a lot more, especially in situations where life expectancy is flat to down to be improving health. Um, question going back to the earlier part of the um, conversation. And that is um, California recently implemented these jungle priorities. And I'm curious both of your views on how you see, if you think that that will actually be an effective means of, of, of broadening the conversation or if it's just gonna end up being that you don't really have a real primary Plus the neutral commission that we also may not be getting. That's another important point. Do you want to take that one? Then I'll... Neutral commissions work. Idaho had one, and it uh, noticeably reduced polarization and led to more moderate candidates. So that was a really great uh, Schwarzenegger idea. Uh, jungle primaries. So I guess I'm a little bit more. Yeah, I'm a little bit more mixed. I, I, again, I put this in the category of it will help, but it's not clear exactly how much because again, um, this comes back to how much how much you think the problem that we're facing is that the primary process is leading to extremist candidates relative to the population, and how much is the population itself is becoming more polarized. Um, redesigning primaries can solve the former problem, but not the latter. I think a big part of what's actually happening is the latter. So again, I put that in the category of let's give it a try, but I'm not entirely sure that it will fully address the problem. Great. In the back, yeah. 
Um, I, I believe that many citizens are, are busy living their lives, so their decisions are influenced by tiny bits of information that they get mainly from the media or from social media, from bloggers, YouTubers, or, or people that, that give them just pieces of information. So how would you say that, what role does media and new media and social networks play in terms of, in terms of polarization? And of course, you've told about Fox and MSNBC, but there's more. So how would you say the rest contribute or not to polarizing? Well, clearly Yahoo is the source of all fact-based, my wife works at Yahoo. Um, what, what, what I think is starting to happen, what will I believe increasingly happen, is that we all select um, kind of filters that are trusted sources for us. So when you want that snippet and, and you want it to be fast and easy, you go to a reference point that has built up some credibility for you uh, as a as a kind of filter on what to think about X. And uh, in some sense, uh, if those reference points are empirically driven and fact-based and what have you, they can offset uh, the phenomenon that we're talking about. But that's not necessarily the outcome because you could also, you know, people in general could wind up relying on, on each side on uh, reference points that are, are less reliable or that are less fact-based. So, it remains to be seen how that how that kind of um, process will play out. But I agree with you. Most people are busy. They don't. It, it doesn't make. It's not. It doesn't make sense for them to spend most of their time thinking about you know how to design the Medicaid program. And so when issues like that come up, they'll look for a, a quick take that kind of fits for their worldview. And uh, Fox and MSNBC are. In some sense, proxies for that, and that's one reason why you do see this. Um, this these polar, but they're not the only ones. And other people, you know, will tune into or rely on other sources. We we don't know where the end game is on that yet. Yeah. Hi, Peter. So I'm. Uh... I'm currently in grad school taking econometrics classes and realizing how illiterate I used to be, probably still am to some extent, when in encountering data and understanding whether a study was well designed or not and whether the findings are really causal or not. And this seems to be a problem throughout the American public, right? We can't really expect people to know whether someone is telling them the truth or not if they don't know how to interpret the data that those people are citing. And I'm wondering if you agree that that's a problem, and if so, how we might go about educating everyday Americans about how to interpret data. Well, it almost comes back to the previous question. I mean, it doesn't make sense for most people or most Americans or most families to, uh, to be studying uh, panel data econometrics because they don't need it in their everyday existence. I do think, and it's interesting, I do think school curriculums, curricula have been shifting in this direction, but I do think teaching probability and statistics at younger ages are, is a very helpful shift. We need a little bit less um, geometry and a little bit more probability and statistics in terms of what will be useful to people, I believe, in, in 15 or 20 years. But that having been said, it, it, it won't ever make sense for most people to go to graduate school in public policy and study um, econometrics. So it comes back to the proxies of the way you're going to do that is look to a source you trust. And uh, it remains unknown at this point how we are going to play. In a sense, and I mentioned this last night, but in a sense, that process was similar in 1970. It's just those sources were the network news and you know your daily newspaper. And those did a pretty good job of making sure that you took out extreme views and that things were backed up by evidence. That's not necessarily the outcome in a new world where um, you can have a multiplicity of, of sources and a multiplicity of authorities. And in a sense, what we're also seeing, this, this uh, may have come up in some of the other sessions today, is uh, 
along some dimensions, that's very healthy. So authority is not, you know, the, the, the national newspaper is not just deferred to, or we have a great example of a national newscaster not just being deferred to in terms of uh, statements that are made. Um, there's also a cost to that because as a, and so that, that part's clearly good, but in general, as authority in those institutions is eroded, we turn to other places for information, which may on average not be as reliable. And so uh, I don't know how all this plays out. We're in the midst of a massive experiment in terms of where people turn to for their easy um, kind of go-to place for what's trusted and what's not. Uh, two more questions. Yes. For your perspective on 2008 regulatory reform, why did it fail, given everything that was happening and the awareness of uh, fact-based policy? So, do you mean uh, the regulatory process, like in OIRA, or do you mean financial regulatory? Financial regulatory reform. So, this is interesting. I um, and again, I actually have I was not involved in that process, and I've stayed away from it. Um, in my current job also, so I would say my fact base is uh, less, uh, le it's, it's not as deep as I, as I hope it is on many other issues. That having been said, um, it is fascinating to me that people on the left basically say it has failed, and then, uh, I don't want to say on the right, but uh, a common complaint is often that it tried to do too much, it wasn't informed by actual experience, and so you've got all these rules that are written that are divorced from actual reality. And that, I think, illustrates that when you're in a polarized political environment and there are big things happening, people are going to be frustrated almost regardless of what happens. It's almost similar to the stimulus, which is the left says it, it wasn't big enough, and the right says it was you know, communism and a disaster. And the truth is, it was a B plus or A minus, it would, in my opinion, it was somewhere in between. The same probably is true with regard to financial regulatory reform. The single most important thing that one can do to prevent future financial crises is to insist on higher levels of capital in financial institutions. If you have highly leveraged financial institutions with very, very thin capital bases, like um, was the case in 2006, 2007, I don't care what kind of other regulations you have or don't have, the margin of error is so small that the probability that one of them will blow up and, and then cascade out is high. If you have much healthier capital bases, the risks are much lower. And the fact of the matter is, whether through financial regulatory reform or through market pressure or what have you, the US financial system has a capital ratio that is dramatically higher today than it was in 2005 or six. So we can debate whether it needs to go higher or whether it's a little bit too high, but I find that development to be far more important than the details over what's happening on derivatives or the local rule or what have you. The sing almost a sufficient statistic for the health, the probability of a financial crisis is the capital ratio that financial institutions are holding against losses. Uh, last question. Thank you for your comments on uh, political polarization and what may be causing it or how Situation. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the economic polarization that we're witnessing. And I know this is a big topic, and uh, but the gap between the rich and the poor, the, the fact that it's increasing, and then the interesting statistic you just gave on the health impact of this dynamic. It's a big topic, but kind of big picture, where do you see it going, and what remedial actions may there be, or you know, how important is that to address immediately? So one way of looking at that is that one of the first things that's taught in intermediate macroeconomics is uh, Nicholas Caldor's stylized facts of economic growth. The very first of which is, supposed, is that the share of income that accrues to labor, national income that accrues to labor into capital is supposed to remain constant over long periods of time. In the United States and in most other developed economies, that's demonstrably false over the past three decades. Um, the share of national income that accrues to labor has fallen by about five percentage points, which is about $750 billion a year. So there's sort of $750 billion in missing labor compensation um, that if that share had remained constant, would be there. Now, why is that? 
I, I believe the biggest expo explanation for that is that the effective global labor supply over the past three decades has doubled to quadrupled, and the effective global capital supply has not. We've opened up through technology and trade, opened up the world market to billions of people, and thereby made their life prospects potentially quite better, but at the same time caused a dramatic shift in effectively the uh, the position of labor in the developed economies. And then exacerbating that is within labor compensation, the share that accrues to top performers has, um, has also increased. So the question then becomes, what can we do about that? And the traditional answer is we need more education. That helps a college education still um, is a protection against, uh, it's not perfect protection, it's less insurance than it was before, but it's still beneficial in shielding you from uh, the effects of uh, a globalized workforce. But that takes 20 or 30 years to play out. So what can we do in the meanwhile? And I'd point to a f just a couple things. One is there was an interesting idea that, that was um, put forward by Larry Summers and Ed Balls uh, about a month ago to try to boost profit sharing plans. So if the, one of the problems is that the returns to capital have gone way up and the returns to labor have not. Let's turn more workers into capitalists by transforming part of their pay package into shares of their companies. Um, another route is actually back to healthcare, which is um, that missing $750 billion. Actually, the evidence also suggests that we waste about $750 billion on healthcare services each year that don't improve patients' outcomes. So if we can make the healthcare system more value-oriented and more efficient, it doesn't change the total labor compensation pool, but it does change the mix within that in terms of how much is take home pay. And then beyond that, one of the reasons why um, I personally uh, have been in favor of progressive taxation is uh, if you can't do much in terms of market outcomes, either through changing the share that's healthcare versus take home pay or through uh, the returns to education and so forth or through profit sharing, you can at least take the edge off in terms of after-tax uh, inequality by pushing against the market trends. And the evidence suggests that basically over the past three decades, while we haven't dramatically exacerbated the pre-tax trends, we also haven't attenuated them. And we could. Uh, Peter Orzag, you have described the tension between political polarization and fact-based policymaking. You've suggested the answers aren't easy. One thing is clear from this conversation, if we're dramatically increasing the sheer quantum of intelligence in American policymaking, you have all of our admiration and thanks. Thank, Thank you. you very much.